Hi. Hello again. We're following up the last segment with the discussion of how the Watchtower handled these specific verses in Daniel in the very time when the 1975 scandal broke. This book was published, Our Incoming World Government, 1977. This is the first year that the Watchtower had a downturn in their yearly statistics. Mm -hmm. This book was published that summer and it dealt again with the book of Daniel. They published Your Will Be Done back in 1958 and now they felt they had to update their views of Daniel. You can tell already from the title, Incoming World Government. Mm -hmm. Well, when you say someone is incoming, a president or a prime minister, it means they're on their way in. Yeah, it's, it's current. It's going to be happening. Yeah, and that was still the speculation at the time, that well, if it's a little delayed, it won't be delayed very long. Mm -hmm. So let's see how they handle it in the book itself, this, this Daniel test. Okay. We today, who can look back over more than 2,580 years of time from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, have far more reason to believe than Nebuchadnezzar ever had that the dream is reliable in meaning, and that its interpretation by Daniel is trustworthy. Hence we are led to, b to believe the word of the grand God. And so from where does destruction of the symbolic image come? From the God of heaven, the one who changes the times and seasons, and who puts down kings and sets up other kings according to his own will. The fixed time for him to do so must be very near. Why so? Because back in early autumn of the year 1914 CE, the last year of the Gentile times, the appointed times of the nations ended. According to Christ's words in Luke 21 verses 20 to 24, this meant that the time had arrived for God to stop the further trampling by the nations on what Jerusalem symbolized. <laughs> so they go from Daniel, the dream being reliable, mm -hmm. Daniel's interpretation of it being reliable, mm -hmm. and jump to, we're led to believe the word of the grand God. And what does that word involve according to the way they jump in this paragraph to the point of some connection with 1914. Yeah, yeah. To me this is blasphemy. It's, you know, you're fixing d dates to to this prophecy. Which has, has nothing to do with dates. Yeah, yeah, it has nothing to do with 1914. They do and it by... you state it like a, a just an, an affirmation here. 2580 years, which mm -hmm. is, of course, accomplished by adding 2520 Gentile times years to the 60 expired years from 1914 to the mm -hmm. mid-1970s. What they're in effect saying is that Daniel 4 and Daniel 2 are somehow synced together so that we can, mm -hmm. we can r reliably depend upon the fact that yeah. before the 1914 generation is over, all of this will be over. Yeah. And of course, we know how that worked out with yeah. 40 years of retrospect. But in the in the paragraph that you read, I I couldn't help but notice that not only did they connect it with Daniel's trustworthiness, but with Christ, but with Christ Himself by saying yeah. something about according to Christ's words in Luke 21. Well, they are Christ's words, yeah. but they had nothing to do with a date, yeah. a last so they, generation. You know, they're they're starting with their conclusion, with what they've already established in their own minds as a truth. 1914 was the end of the Gentile times. They've established that in their own minds, and that's their starting point. And now everybody else has to follow in, please. Yeah, this is called, in Humpty Dumpty Land, this is called eisegesis, reading your theology, your ideas, into the text. Mm -hmm. And then th they have the gall at the end of it to talk about what Jerusalem symbolized. Yeah. When Jesus spoke these words, which he spoke only once in the four Gospels, mm -hmm. about the the appointed times of the nations, of the Gentile times. He was talking about literal Jerusalem, literal Jews. Read yeah. the whole text, Being the whole context. On. You don't throw in the word symbolized because you don't believe it really is Jerusalem. 
in the context he's talking about about Jerusalem being surrounded by armies Mm -hmm. he's talking about them being taken captive and and taken into all nations and Mm -hmm. then he says this about the appointed times of the nations being fulfilled well what obviously does the context infer then that one day this situation will be over the Jews will no longer be scattered Mm -hmm. throughout the world yeah. Now that's all in the context, but you would not know that here. Yeah. You would think it's something yeah. about the times. Yeah. So the frustration is, as we said in a prior video, really about how they do Bible interpretation at all. Mm-hmm. By, by, yeah. by putting bits and pieces of Scripture into a paragraph like this, you can make Scripture do anything. Yeah. yeah, the problem is you don't study the Bible through a book with bits and pieces, some of it quoted, but not you never seeing it in context. One of the points we need to derive from this, though, is obviously that when, when Nebuchadnezzar thinks about proof of God, proof of God's spokesman or prophet, mm-hmm. or the sign of a servant, you might refer to it, when he thinks of a servant of God and a, a, a true prophet, he thinks of inspiration and in, in, infallible interpretation as somehow being tied together. The Watchtower has managed to sever these ideas and make it so that you don't actually claim either. Yeah. So then, obviously, the question is, why should I believe you? Yeah. Why should I follow you? So here's a question to ask a Jehovah's Witness. Mm-hmm. Here's, here we go. Please explain to me, if God in the past took the trouble to inspire those whom he sent, or give them at least infallible interpretations, Why should he now ask us to trust uninspired, fallible spokesmen? Mm -hmm. Is this the Jehovah who does not change? Now Malachi 3.6 says, I am Jehovah, I do not change. The Mm Watchtower version says, I have not changed. So why isn't he following the same pattern that we see he's used with Mm -hmm. his prophets in the past? If these are indeed the last days, the culmination of the system of things to which all those prophets pointed, why is he not using the same test? Right. So the Daniel test, I think we have to take to every dialogue with Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, yeah. Now you mentioned there's there's other there's other prophets with the same like the you know if you trace it in the Bible, he's using those same standards. Yeah. All the way through. For instance, Moses himself. Moses demonstrates the omnipotence of God in the miracles, but he also demonstrates, because he is the first of the great prophets, the line of the prophets, he demonstrates God's omniscience by making true prophecy. Samuel, about 400 years later, right. it says of him in 1 Samuel 3 that none of the words which Samuel spoke fell to the ground. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there's the contest in Jeremiah 28. Yeah, which that, made so much to you. Yeah, that one is an important one to read. Read Jeremiah chapter 28, the whole thing. With a witness. Yeah, well, first read it on your own. <laughs> but yes, with a witness would be great. Because you do, it's so clear in that one. You've got this, There, it's not even that this, the, uh, the opponent to Jeremiah, he's not denying everything Jeremiah says is going to happen, but his timing is what he gets different. He, the only thing he changes is the timing. Mm-hmm. He says, not 70 years, right? He says two years. Two. And God shows who to listen to. He vindicates Jeremiah. Yeah, within the two years. Hananiah dies yeah. the first year. Yeah. So right away, Jeremiah's authority is underlined or vindicated. Now contrast Mm -hmm. that with the Watchtower's claim that they, in 1919, were tested and passed the test, and from then then on, they're God's only organization. What what were they being tested on? The Finnish mystery? All of the claims, all of the claims of the Finnish mystery Mm -hmm. were testable within a few years, and they all came crashing down. I think it's interesting, too, that it's, it's timing for them as well. Yeah that they're doing the same thing as Hananiah was. They've got their own time schedule, one that they like. Never put God on a, on a tight schedule. Yeah, they want to put God on that schedule. Yeah, now there's a couple more quotes here, mm-hmm. treasurable quotes from the government book that we should put before everybody. Yes, I will read them. 141, is it? Yeah. What was it that convinced the prophet Daniel, as well as the leading politician of the day, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, that the one 
who could give such a preview of thousands of years of human history and thus be declaring the end from the beginning had to be God Almighty. It was the humanly impossible requirements that stood in the way of such a revelation. The forgotten dream seemed to convey a message of supreme importance to him. He put his astrologers and magic practicing priests to an abnormal test by demanding that they should not only interpret the dream, but first of all, recall it to the king's mind. Because they called such a demand wholly unreasonable, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered them to be put to death as being frauds in their prophetic profession. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Where, <laughs> who said, are Jehovah's Witnesses in this story? Yeah. They're the frauds. They are the ones who are claiming that they will interpret, but will not go out on a limb by telling yeah. what revelation the king had had. So they, and we're being unreasonable to we're, expect something from them. We're only human. Yeah. Well, then don't make the claims you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think Nebuchadnezzar is wholly consistent here in saying, death to everybody, let's start <laughs> all over again. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Daniel, it shows the divine compassion as well as the divine mind in this situation and ends up rescuing everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. So I believe uh, in in the in the end we have to underline the general principle that's at stake here, namely that the, the Daniel has made a claim based upon his faith in the true God, which is demonstrated in the case of the three Hebrew youths. In already that they're uh, they have been blessed by God, they've been given positions of prominence in the in the empire. And now God is putting Daniel's faith and their faith and Nebuchadnezzar's perceptions to the test by demanding demanding that Nebuchadnezzar is making a demand that only a prophet of God could fulfill. And the test he's asking is one that we should definitely put before Jehovah's Witnesses every time we get a chance. What are the credentials of your organization? Mm -hmm. There's the two tests, the inspired revelation test, the inspired interpretation test. Do you, do you even claim to qualify on those two tests? And the answer has to be now, no, they mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. And they've already not met the, th the first test. The first test is the pretest of, will you be even invited into Nebuchadnezzar's inner circle? Mm -hmm. And they fail, the watchtower has failed all three tests. Mm -hmm. So what what must we do if we are talking to Jehovah's Witnesses? We can't ha help but be critical when the, when you make an exclusive claim to divine credentials and you mm -hmm. say that nobody else on the planet is speaking for God but you, right. then it seems to me you've got to meet a higher test than, than Daniel. Mm -hmm. At least the same test as Daniel and Moses before him and mm -hmm. Samuel before him. Right. I don't see that the God who cannot change can do otherwise, but but make all of us scrutinize any religion that makes exclusive yeah. claims yeah. by the same test that he has used over and over again in the Bible mm -hmm. consistently. Yeah.